Pratt Institute is a major art, design, and architecture school known throughout the region, known throughout the United States, and known throughout the world. It's the largest school of its type in the nation, has about 4,750 students, about 1,100 faculty members. We've got about uh, 25, 26 majors here at Pratt. And the reason we wanted a new building was we needed space. We simply did not have enough space in our existing buildings for all the programs that needed to be expanded physically and also new programs that we wanted to bring online. I'm Jack Esterson. I am a design partner at WASA Studio A Architects here in New York. And we designed the building you see behind me uh, called Myrtle Hall. Uh, Myrtle Hall is Pratt's first uh, LEED Gold certified building, which is really significant for Pratt and for the entire community. In fact, it's the second highest uh, LEED certification possible. Um, and I think personally really important uh, as a way to demonstrate environmental responsibility to our future generations of architects and designers that are now being trained at Pratt. One of the things that we're so proud of with regard to this building is that it is the only LEED certified building found on any college or university campus in all of Brooklyn. Secondly, it's one of the very, very few found in all of New York City. This project will be getting about 45 of the LEED points out of a total possible of 69. So when you think that you can become LEED certified at the certified level or at the silver level, gold and platinum levels, then attaining a gold level certification is a fairly a prestigious mark to hit. LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design and sort of the concept behind it was generating a, a tool that designers can use to take a whole building approach to sustainability so that you wouldn't necessarily just do one thing, maybe just address energy efficiency and call it a green building. Maybe not just plop a green roof on the top of it and call it a green building. But make sure that you're addressing the indoor environmental quality. Make sure you're addressing site issues and water and energy. And then standardizing in a way that can be easily accessible to anyone involved in a capital program. I have lived in this neighborhood for 40 years. And because I've been so active in, in the Pratt community by teaching, going here, getting my degree, for me, it was the exercise of designing this building was, was really bringing those two things together. Um, somehow um, satisfying the needs, both functional, pragmatic, and aesthetic needs of Pratt um, with the needs of the community. The site is so clearly um, two-sided. So on Myrtle, what we did was we developed a very contemporary kind of reinterpretation of that mercantile uh, red brick vernacular architecture. Um, it goes up four stories, it kind of honors the scale of the neighborhood without being um, sort of replica architecture or mimicking exactly uh, the architecture that exists. Um, on the south side, my instinct was that the, the building needed to be far more transparent, lightweight, uh, gesturing back to the campus, almost as if the campus was being enveloped by, by the building, and that's why it's almost all glass. There's a certain transparency and openness to the building, uh, which sort of gives a visual connection. If you're on campus, you can certainly see the building and uh, because of the, the glazing of it, particularly at night, it shines, you can see it. The building is a total of 116,000 square feet. Um, the cellar and first floor will have a mixed use. Uh, parts of the cellar will be for retail storage, uh, which will be occupied by another party other than Pratt. Uh, the first floor is gonna be shared by a Pratt lobby at the south center of the building, and the remaining parts of the first floor will be retail stores. Second through roof will be all Pratt areas. The top part of the building will be uh, mechanical space for Pratt, and there's also the elevator machine room above that. The other areas of the building uh, for Pratt, uh, parts will be administrative, like the bursar, registrar, uh, financial aid, human resources, um, and other departments. And then the fourth and fifth floors will mainly be the digital arts department. Behind me, we affectionately call this white linear element on the building the ribbon, uh, it's known as. And it's really meant as a symbolic gesture at first on the uh, left side as the entry point of the building. 
and then horizontally it brings you towards the main stair, leads you up the staircase, and then ultimately defines the four-story spatial gesture known as the atrium, which is really the sort of central social mixing space for the building and all the diverse uh, departments that are housed in it. It also sort of unifies the interior of a building. Many times you go into a building and you have no connection to the various floors of the building. In an office building, that's okay because you know there's not much um, business going on between floors. But in, a, in an academic facility, you know there's a certain oneness to purpose. There are certain sections of, of the atrium where they're going to display artwork. They're going to be pin-up art on display in the second floor gallery space as well as there's another exhibition space on the fourth floor. We try to achieve a number of different aspects to the landscape in order to help support the goal of a lead gold building. So it starts with minimizing the amount of impermeable surface, which means the paving, and that paving we've made as light colored as possible so it reflects the heat of the summer. We have a large number of areas that will absorb and filter rainwater in what we call uh, bioretention basins. In this case, actually, we have two things happening. One is we are collecting all of the stormwater from the plaza and even from the surrounding parking lots uh, into areas that are going to be filled with plants. They have a slight depression so that they can allow water to accumulate up to about six inches. And then because Pratt is over the Long Island Aquifer, the water will drain down through the plant roots, which will help cleanse that water. And then uh, over time, it will percolate down into the Long Island Aquifer, which is a major source of water for a lot of Long Island. The use of native and adaptive vegetation helps to promote uh, biodiversity and habitat uh, when you look at it and compare it to you know, typical just turf grass use on most campuses. We have two areas of green roof. There's a, a section on the fifth floor. There's also a section up on the uh, mechanical penthouse. It's basically a vegetation mat. What we do is prepare the sub-base of the roof. It's almost like an inverted roof system. Uh, typically what you do is you put insulation, then you put all your waterproofing layers, and then either a ballast or walking treads. The green roofs utilize the waterproofing on the, as the base layer and then install insulation on top of that. Then there's drainage mats and then we put this vegetation layer. What the green roof does is it replaces those heat absorbing surfaces and allows you to absorb the heat within, within the green roof so that you're not radiating it back to, to the surrounding areas. When you walk into the building, what immediately hits you is the, uh, the sun-shaded louvers. Uh, what they do is to reduce the sun glare and the daylight coming into the building. It protects the occupants from glare and it protects the heating system from direct uh, sunlight. And they also act to bounce light deeper into the interior of the space so that you're able to get deeper into the occupied areas but you don't create um, areas where it might be difficult to work due to glare and, and other hot spots. And critical to any kind of daylighting uh, scheme is making sure you get a nice even distribution of daylight inside the space. The distance between the sun shades is, is to provide more shade as well as I think it gives a, a better aesthetic feel as well. Like at times of day you'll notice the cast on the floor from those shades will change with the sun. So we have special glazing on the job that acts as a heat mirror and reflects heat away from the building in the summertime, keeps heat in the building during the winter but also make sure that the occupants have some sort of connection to the exterior environment, be that visual or be that through just their exposure to the light levels. Even the interior partitions are made up of uh, either glass in the door or a side light of glass that will just reduce the amount of electric use to light the building. Photovoltaic panels are glass panels on the exterior of the building with sensors in them that absorb the sunlight, convert that sun into electrical power. And that power is brought into the main grid of the building and used internally. Those photovoltaic cells are targeted to account for anywhere between two and two and a half percent of the building's overall electricity use, which is a way of offsetting um, electricity that would be generated by more polluting means. It'll charge itself over time with the sunlight 
And at some point, you know, Con Ed will contact Pratt and say, hey, can you go off the grid? And what happens is those solar panels will feed back into the system and reduce the energy use from Con Ed. There's an opportunity when you have natural light outside to reduce uh, interior lighting requirements. To achieve this is through daylight harvesting and it typically involves placing a sensor in close proximity to the perimeter of the building. Each floor has four lighting zones um, that's controlled by the photosensor. A photosensor se essentially measures the amount of natural light and in response reduces the artificial lighting such that we don't need it if there's sufficient light. So on a day like today when it's relatively sunny outside, we have a lot of natural light that we're illuminating the space. What they're also going to do with the lighting system is tie it into the automated uh, HVAC control system. So they'll dim lights as well in order to reduce heat gain from the lights in the space and, and therefore which would re reduce air conditioning use. If you'll notice in the penthouse there are uh, five uh, major air handling units, um, two for each side of the building and then there's one for uh, some other common areas within the building. They're internal air handlers so they're not uh, subject to weather conditions out on the roof. Um, there is a series of external louvers that bring the fresh air in. There are fans that draw that air into the building through a filtration system and then it gets ducted down shafts at the core of the building and then feed out to all the floors. Sometimes in the intermediate season you have outside air conditions are, are sufficient to meet the needs of the space so you don't need to perform any heating or cooling. This is called an economizer cycle. So the, the air handling units have the ability to bring in 100% outside air and the control system it's polling a number of monitoring points and it knows when the conditions are conducive to allow economizer operation. The air handling system on this project employs a technology called demand control ventilation whereby there are CO2 sensors in meeting rooms and classrooms and other multi-occupant spaces that actually monitor the concentrations of carbon dioxide that we're emitting every time we exhale. What that does is it allows the system to automatically bring in outside air when the room needs it. And it allows you to go below the constant volume that code requires when the room isn't occupied. So it's both a comfort feature and an energy efficiency feature. And that comfort, if you've ever been in a classroom or a meeting room or a conference room and it's going on into the afternoon, you're finding that it's difficult to concentrate or focus, you may even nod off a little bit. Um, it has more to do with the fact that the air quality is, is compromised. You're breathing higher and higher concentrations of carbon dioxide and less outside air. So being able to automatically adjust that creates a more comfortable environment and it also allows for a better learning environment. Building temperature is regulated by a sophisticated automated control system. Uh, so there's a building ma a management system um, that is network controlled. Um, it interfaces with every piece of equipment you see in the building. So all the um, VAV boxes, um, air handling units, uh, boilers, pumps, everything is on this one network system. Um, it can be controlled remotely. Uh, there's, a t there's a series of temperature sensors throughout the building. Um, each individual area is zone, has its own zone. So um, the human resources department on one side of the building can be controlled separately from the financial aid department at another section of the building depending on what the end user in that area is requesting for temperature. You'll notice throughout the ceilings of the building there's uh, about thousands of feet of a cable tray system uh, that delivers communication wires, um, internet wire, fiber optic, all to the different offices and spaces of the building. Um, one of the re main reasons to use a cable tray system in an exposed ceiling is uh, the ability to expand the system at a later date. So there's no, um, uh, if they decide to add computer stations, different offices, they can rewire and add wire and delete wire as necessary um, very easily. So it really provides an, uh, an ease for the end user to expand. In terms of water efficiency, this, this building when we calculated out the water efficiency is going to use 45% less water than the baseline according to the lead rating system. So the faucets and the toilet fixtures and the showers, they all really contribute to maximizing the water efficiency. 
And there's a lot of energy that goes into treating water and, and pumping water to buildings. So water use efficiency is also energy efficiency. One of the points that's available is to encourage uh, bicycle riding. Therefore, we provided um, a lot of bicycle racks outside the building, very conveniently located to the main entrance. Um, and we also provided showers um, in the building uh, for people, particularly in the summer, when they're riding from a distance um, that they can actually shower. I think creating a lead gold building at Pratt is very important. Um, at a very base level because Pratt has a, a sustainability program. Uh, and by building a new building, um, it's, it's part and parcel that they're going to do at LEED. So it becomes something of a flagship, saying, to see this, you know, we don't just talk it, we do it. I don't think sustainability in design is important. I think it's essential. I think it's beyond important. We, as architects, have to get serious about reducing fat and reducing the carbon footprint of buildings, or we're not going to make it. Anyone working in the urban realm really need, needs to think about is how can we help kind of undo a lot of the damage that we've done and, and try to reestablish uh, natural systems that are in the long run sustainable. And I think that this building goes a long way to doing that and we've tried to do our share uh, for the site work around the building. But it's, it's mostly about an attitude toward, uh, toward living, toward uh, education, and uh, in my particular profession toward, toward design. This building, in terms of the thinking, the planning, the design and development of this building, as well as the construction of this building, all ties in to sustainability. Some buildings might have some photovoltaics, but that's rare. Some buildings might have a green roof, but that's, that's rare. But to have all of those things in one building to serve as a model and a teaching tool means that this building will be a great example for future construction in this area. One of the reasons I got into the construction market uh, is at the end of the day you produce something that's real and you can touch it and you can say I was heavily involved in that and really take uh, pride in what you do.